Today on the Matt Wall Show, the left claims that there is a right-wing book banning movement growing across the country, but they're lying as usual. We'll look at the facts today. Also, the CDC recommends that the COVID vaccine be added to your child's regular immunization schedule. Elon Musk plans to fire the majority of Twitter employees. I'm taking my What is a Woman tour to Berkeley and expecting a very open and welcoming environment when I get there. In our daily cancellation, a man faces the internet outrage mob after suggesting that men and women experience depression differently. The horror. All of that and more today on The Matt Walsh Show. Here at The Daily Wire, we are committed to winning back the culture. Losing is just not an option. There's too much riding on it. And part of that means supporting businesses whose values align with our own, which is why I'm very excited to tell you that we've teamed up with Black Rifle Coffee Company. Many of you know about Black Rifle already. It's a veteran-founded and operated coffee company who've made it their mission to hire 10,000 veterans, and they're well on their way. One of the many laudable things Black Rifle does is they help service members successfully transition from the military into entrepreneurship. And they're constantly giving back to veteran foundations, as well as law enforcement and first responders. By purchasing from Black Rifle Coffee Company, you are directly supporting the military service community. What about the coffee itself? Well, that's important too. And I can tell you it's bold, strong, and really good. Black Rifle is very selective about where they source their coffee beans from. And they're disciplined when it comes to ensuring the freshness of every bag. So go to blackriflecoffee.com and use promo code Walsh for 10% off your first order. Or when you sign up for a new coffee club subscription, The subscription gives you free shipping on all coffee club orders, early access to club deals and promotions, and special discounts from their partner brands. That's blackriflecoffee.com with promo code Walsh for 10% off your first order, or when you sign up to become a coffee club member, Black Rifle Coffee, supporting veterans and America's coffee. Well, today is the day. Shortly after we finish filming this episode, I'll be heading downtown to the Capitol building here in Nashville for our rally to end child mutilation. We are expecting a large turnout, perhaps a significant presence of counter-protesters also, I don't know. But we also can't know for sure exactly what to expect because there's never been a rally of this size and scale on this issue before, as far as I know. Um, We are building a movement. We're starting from the ground floor because someone has to do it. And we've decided that it may as well be us. Now, there is, of course, plenty of value in uh, talking and uh, uh, delivering opinions making arguments, the kinds of things uh, that we do here in conservative media every day. But the problem is that in conservative media for so long, that's essentially all we have ever done. And I'm just kind of tired of only talking. It's time to take action. And that's what we're going to do this afternoon. The fight, of course, doesn't end today, just like it doesn't start today. But this is the beginning of a necessary phase in the fight, the phase where we actually take to the street, show up in person, the sort of thing that... uh, The left has been very good at doing for a long time and and been doing it basically unopposed. Because it's not enough to to post about these sorts of things online. We have to be a physical presence visible to the world. Now, there's certainly a risk in that because the more you put yourself out there, the more you open yourself up to all sorts of potential consequences. But I'm more than ready to take the risk, and I hope you are too. Although there isn't as much risk as you might think. Not if we actually really mobilize, because we have, we have numbers on our side, to, a, to an enormous degree, in fact. The Daily Wire has this report today, quote, a new poll found that nearly 80% of American voters believe that minors should be required to wait until they are adults to pursue transgender procedures. The national survey conducted by Convention of States Action in partnership with the Trafalgar Group Polled over 1,000 likely uh, 2022 election voters in October. When asked if they believed underage minors should be required to wait until they're adults to use puberty blockers and undergo permanent sex change procedures, the poll found that 78.7% of all respondents comprising Democrats, Republicans, and nonpartisan affiliations said that they should, in fact, wait. The overwhelming majority of Republicans and independent voters opposed gender change treatments for minors while Democrats were divided. 96.8% of Republican voters, 84.6% of independent voters, and 53.2% of Democrats, which is still a majority, said that minors should wait until they are adults to pursue medical transition. Okay, so that's 80% of Americans in all. You will not find 80% agreement on almost anything. You probably can't find 80% of Americans who will agree that the sun rose this morning. And On this subject, on protecting children from gender ideology, indoctrination, mutilation, abuse, 
There is as close to unanimous consensus as you will ever get on any issue. And yet, these atrocities have happened all across the country. They continue to happen. The gender ideologues have been operating, again, nearly unopposed for years. In spite of the fact that hundreds of millions of Americans actually do oppose them. That's because the opposition doesn't mean anything and has no effect if it's purely uh, theoretical and abstract. If we don't mobilize, if we don't convert it into action, we remain powerless, even with an army of hundreds of millions behind us. This is about actually using the power that we have. There is an opportunity for a broad, vast, enormous, and even, yes, diverse coalition on this, on this issue. And there's also evidence that the coalition is already coming together. Take what's happening in Dearborn, Michigan, for example. Dearborn is a traditionally a Democratic stronghold. It's also a heavily Muslim area with Arab Americans comprising nearly about 50% of the city's population, I think. Now, given historical voting habits, it's not the kind of place where Democrats have had to worry about mass protest movements challenging them. They don't have to worry about anyone challenging them from, from the right or even the left. And yet that is exactly what's happened. The Muslim community in Dearborn uh, has mobilized, showing up in huge numbers at school board meetings and at rallies to oppose LGBT indoctrination in the school system there. Now, this, uh, this particular round of backlash was provoked by pornographic and sexually explicit LGBT propaganda, which had been made available to children in the local school system. One of the books at the center of the firestorm is called, uh, you might have heard this title before because it's come up in, in other places at school board meetings, but the book is called This Book is Gay. And it contains not only the promotion of, but also the extremely graphic description of gay sex. And the content is so graphic, it's so explicit, it's so beyond the bounds of what could remotely be considered appropriate for children that I can't read any of it to you or even describe it. But I will tell you, it was more than enough to inspire the largely Muslim community to take action. And at a rally a few days ago, one local father got up at the microphone and uh, made his case and made it, I think, quite powerfully. Listen to this. I just want to thank everybody for coming out. My name is Hassan Shami. I'm nothing but a concerned parent in Dearborn, Michigan. Um, guys, we want to make something clear, okay? We want to leave the politics out of this. If you're on Facebook, all you see is fear-mongering political rhetoric that this is book banning, censorship, homophobic. All it is is protecting our children. We... We as concerned parents, we as concerned parents in Dearborn are not tied to the left, to the right when it comes to this issue. And we're not going to be used as pawns for any organization for their own agenda. We're here to protect our children. Do not fall for the political rhetoric on Facebook, on Instagram. Do not fall for the trap because that's what they want. They're trying to smear us. They're trying to control the narrative. They're trying to say this is homophobic. Listen, there's a, there's a book. There's a book that was banned. It was called This Book is Gay. And I tell you, if the book was called This Book is Straight, we're still going to go after it. Because it's teaching kids. It's teaching kids how to go online and have sexual intercourse with others on the internet. This is wrong. You do not expose kids to sexually explicit material. There's a... There's a poster right here to my right. There's a poster right here to my right that I had them cover up. I, as an adult, a 33-year-old adult, told them cover it up because I'm embarrassed to look at this. You think I want a 13-year-old to look at it? This is ridiculous. Any semi-decent human being, homosexual or heterosexual, knows when they look in the mirror that kids should not be exposed to this. Stop trying to control the rhetoric. Stop trying to make it as you guys are the victims because this has nothing to do with it. We as parents who are raising our children are responsible for our children. Our schools will not indoctrinate our children. The, prog the progressive dogma from the top down that has public schools in a total will not indoctrinate our children. Amen. And it's as simple as that. He's a father, doesn't want his children sexually indoctrinated in the school system. That's it. Of course, according to the left, this makes him literally Hitler. Uh, which, speaking of which, here's a, a liberal white woman at a school board meeting um, in, in Dearborn trying to explain that the, the largely Muslim population that uh, don't want their kids exposed to graphic gay sex are indeed just like Hitler. 
not in favor of banning any books in Dearborn. If parents do not want their children to read a book, they should not allow them to do that. But to voice their views of one group of citizens on the rest of Dearborn doesn't work either. This is what Hitler did. And we all know how that worked out. Oh, yeah, we, we know how that worked out. Um, first, you're preventing teachers from talking to sixth graders about anal sex. Next thing you know, there's a holocaust. That's what we're supposed to believe anyway. Of course, she says that um, she doesn't want the views of the anti-porn for children factions to be foisted on everybody else, but she does want the views of the other side foisted. In the end, this is a conflict of viewpoints. There's One side says that children should be sexually indoctrinated in the school system. The other side says that they should not. Both are attempting to impose that point of view. Okay, if you're, if you're involved in an issue on either side of it, you have a point of view that you are trying to get across. You are advocating. And it's up to each side to make the case for themselves. Something that these groomers are unable to do, which is why they settle for wildly misrepresenting their opponents. Indeed, the whole notion that parents are calling for book bans is ridiculous. These are not book bans. No school in the world, okay, contains every book ever published. Schools can only catalog and assign and include in their curriculum a finite number of books. Like of all the books ever made, it, a, a small sliver of a percentage of those books will be in the school and will be part of the curriculum. And so it's just a matter of deciding which books do we include. Like we can include 0.0001% of all books and all the rest are excluded, that doesn't mean that the 99.999% have been banned. They've been burned. It's censorship. No, the books that are not included haven't been banned. They haven't been censored. They've simply been judged irrelevant or inappropriate for the school. Yesterday, Carla Hernandez, a running mate for Charlie Crist in Florida, uh, posted a, a video where she goes through what she describes as a banned math book. And she captions the video, today's chalkbook talk deals with the ridiculous book banning happening in Florida. Remember, knowledge is power and we should have the freedom to learn. Now, I should note that the tweet currently up on her page is her second attempt to tweet this. In the first tweet, which, uh, which was quickly deleted, she misspelled the word knowledge, which is hilarious. But that's not the biggest issue here. The biggest issue here is that she's just straight up lying about why this book was quote unquote banned, which again, it was not banned, just isn't being used in the school system. But here's what she says. Listen to this. And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's Chalkboard Talk. Today, from the desk of Miss Hernandez. Today, I want to talk about something that turned out to be a little bit controversial this past year with Governor Ron DeSantis. It was the banning of books. Did you know that Florida is the second state with the most banned books in the entire country? Yes, what an awful statistic. We are the second state, which means we are the ones that um, keep kids or people from having access to knowledge. And we know that knowledge is power. So I did a little bit of research, try to figure out why math was controversial this year and why we, met, we banned math books. Or not we, let me say why he did, why he banned math books. So I got this math book. Um, it is a fifth grade math book in our public schools. Um, and I started to do some research. As you, as you will notice, we did a lot of notes. There's a lot of controversy in this book. Yes, the controversy is real. So let me show you some examples of the controversy. Example number one, Juan gets $6 for his weekly allowance and spends four. His sister Tina gets $7. Girls shouldn't make more money than Juan. We know why this was banned. Example number two, Dan has a flower shop. Boys, flower shop, we're not doing that. Okay, first of all, she can't even speak, let alone write. Um, so this is someone who probably should have spent more time reading, reading textbooks herself. S second state with the most banned books. You mean it's the state with the second most banned books is what you're trying to say. Even though, again, that's not true. Everything else she says there is an enormous load of nonsense. To be clear, she's, she's simply making this up. So they went through the book and they just invented reasons why it was banned. It made them up out of whole cloth. I guess it was probably a lot of fun. They picked up the, the math book and they flipped through it 
and they found and they took copious amounts of notes and they came up with fantasy scenarios and fantasy reasons why the right would be supposedly uh, objecting to the book. They're hoping that you're stupid enough to believe that Florida banned a math book because it depicts a man owning a flower shop. Yeah, that's in the law, isn't it? That's somewhere in the law. Maybe that's in the don't say gay law, which doesn't exist either. But uh, since the law doesn't exist, I guess it, any, it, it could say anything. Yeah, it's somewhere in there. I got, I got to check. Uh, maybe it's on the third page. of the. It's, uh, it says that uh, you're not allowed to mention uh, men owning flower shops in any textbook. Now, in reality, this math book and others like it were rejected from the curriculum because they uh, include gratuitous political indoctrination, which has nothing to do with anything she just read there. So here's one example. I'm not sure if it's from the book that she's using because she doesn't tell us which book it is, but this gives you an idea of the kind of thing that Florida is guarding against. So as an NBC News report shows, one math book was rejected because it contained a chart which purports to measure racial prejudice by political identification, showing you which political identification is the most racist. And I think you know where this is going to end. The chart, of course, claims that conservatives are the most racially prejudiced. Now, why does that disqualify the book? Because it is a blatant attempt to smuggle partisan propaganda into a math lesson. It's also not true. It's false. The only way that you can justify the claim that conservatives are more racially prejudiced than liberals is if you discount from the start all forms of anti-white racial prejudice. The only way, because the left, especially in modern times, is wildly anti-white racist and it's, it's fully mainstream and fully accepted. And they also support policies, actual systemic discrimination against white people through the form of affirmative action and other, quote, diversity policies and that sort of thing. So the only way that you can look at that and then still say that well, conservatives are more racially prejudiced is if you just declare from the start that all forms of anti-white prejudice don't count because it's not racist. Of course, the book does have that view, it does discount that because the left believes that white people, by definition, cannot be the victims of racism. Th this belief is a core element of critical race theory. Critical race theory, then, is in the book, propaganda, lies, included in a math lesson. It's gratuitous, it's irrelevant, it's erroneous. That's why Florida schools don't include the book in their curriculum. The other side lies about the reasons because all they have are lies. They are losing the argument, and they know it. That's what this all comes down to. They're losing the argument in Florida. They're losing it in Dearborn, Michigan. They're losing it here in Nashville. And we're going to demonstrate that today. Now let's get to our five headlines. What do you think uh, you consider to be your, your family's values? Faith? Church on Sunday, does your family believe in, in serving? Did you vaccinate your kids or did you say, hell no? How does your family define men and women? What kind of value do they put on human life? Your children look to you to define their values and their perspectives of the world. But what if you weren't here to do that for them, to help in that way? In the event that you die, you will ensure the values that you hold dear are, are upheld by your kids. How are you going to do that? Well, you'll do that with epic will. They can help with that. A will lets you determine who will raise your kids in the event that you die before them and before you're done raising them. This is a, a big deal, and it's your responsibility as a parent. It's why we at The Daily Wire have partnered with Epic Will. So take five minutes today. Go to epicwill.com and use promo code Walsh to save 10% on Epic Will's complete will package. Uh, but more importantly, you're doing it so that I know that you did it because I'm keeping track. So you are accountable to me is the point. So that I, I know that you took this crucial step towards doing the right thing and taking care of your family. I know who you are. I'll be checking. Epicwill.com, promo code Walsh. No excuses. Get it done. All right, let's begin with this news from Politico. Headline, CDC advisors recommend adding COVID shots to routine immunization schedules for kids and adults. The CDC's independent vaccine advisors voted 15 to 0, big surprise there, Thursday to uh, add most COVID-19 vaccines offered in the U.S. to the childhood, adolescent, and adult immunization schedules. 
The immunization schedules, which are uh, updated every fall before going into effect the following year, consolidate all the CDC's vaccine recommendations into one document for states that use them as guidance for school entry requirements and busy physicians. The um, additions uh, formalize recommendations. That's an interesting qualifier, actually. There are guidance for school requirements and busy physicians. Why do you include busy? What is, what is the fact? What is the fact that the physicians are busy? What does that have to do with any? How does that relate? How is that relevant to the the recommended immunization schedule? Well, I know how it relates. Is what they're saying is that uh, well, physicians they, they don't have time to look at people on a case by case basis. They don't have time to consider what you actually need medically, and so uh, they need they need just broad strokes, and they're going to give the same shots and the same drugs to everybody. That's what they're saying. Anyway, the additions formalized recommendations the CDC has already made on COVID vaccination in individuals ages six months and older for shots that the FDA has approved or has authorized for emergency use. COVID vaccine inclusion on the schedules don't constitute mandates, particularly for school children, which are the purview of states, localities, or jurisdictions, depending on local laws. Still, the committee's vote sparked controversy and debate on social media about what the additions mean for vaccine requirements after Fox News' Tucker Carlson asserted Tuesday that the CDC would trigger mandates for students. Oh, Tucker Carlson asserted that. That's his claim. Well, he may have asserted it, but uh, that's because Tucker Carlson, you know, unlike uh, many of his critics, has a brain, and he's able to observe things. And so he has noticed that when the CDC recommends something, it almost immediately becomes a mandate in many different states. And localities. That's 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 the way. That's that's how the pipeline works. Yeah, the CDC can't itself mandate anything, but once they have their recommendations, it becomes a mandate. That's not that's not speculation. That's not a, a, a theory. He's not looking in a crystal ball. All you have to do is look at recent history to know that's the case. So pretty soon, this will become a mandate for for entry into schools and so on. Um, fortunately, my kids don't go to public school, so I don't have to worry about that because when it comes to giving my kids the COVID vaccine, my answer has not changed. And my answer in summary is that you can go to hell kindly. Um, no offense. I mean that in the, in the politest way, but you can still go to hell. You know, my, here's the thing. My kids have had COVID, I think like a dozen times, probably. I mean, who really knows? Because we don't generally test for it and, uh, but they get COVID symptoms, otherwise known as a cold you know, otherwise known as cold symptoms, and they have the sniffles, and then they're fine. And that's it. And we go about our lives. You know, vaccinate for that. You know, man, recommend, which turns into a mandate for a vaccine against the sniffles for kids, which is all it has ever been from the very beginning. So one of the, one of the few things that we knew about COVID from the very beginning and that, has, and that has remained unchanged is that this has very little impact on kids. And yet there are still parents that are lining up to, to put these drugs into their kids. It's unconscionable. This is from Yaf. It says, members of the University of Alabama's Generation Action chapter are uh, planning to protest Matt Walsh's upcoming What is a Woman screening event on campus hosted by the university's Young Americans for Freedom chapter. Um, Ashley Whitmire, president of the Planned Parenthood-sponsored student organization, wrote in a group chat, I know many of you are disheartened and angry about Matt Walsh's visit to campus, as we are on the executive. Uh, we have been in touch with other like-minded orgs, and together we are organizing a protest. Members of the AF chapter caught several leftist vandals splashing water on one of their sidewalk chalk event announcements, um, and then other things as well, and they're calling. So it's, it's the same story. They're calling for the university to... to uh, put a stop to the talk and all that. Now, I bring this up because, um, well, a couple of reasons. One is that we were we were just talking about banning and censorship and all of that. And as I explained, and we have to continue explaining, um, what we're talking about doing, or or what's being advocated for in the school systems in Dearborn and else place, el elsewhere, does is not a book ban. Except unless you want to say that, again, 99.999% of all books ever written are banned, quote unquote, in every school in the world. Because they can't all be included. You know, in, in Florida, uh, the NBC report said that, I don't know, they said something like, uh, I forget what the exact number was, but I don't know, 60 or 70 out of a potential 150 plus math books 
have been, quote, banned, otherwise known as rejected. But are we going to have 150 math textbooks? We have 150 different math curriculums uh, circulating out there? No, you have to select a few. There's, there's, there can only be so, so many that are in the school system. And you're going to have standards by which you select it. It's just, this is really a question. The debate is really, what should the standard be? It's not whether there should be one. What is the standard? What are you looking for in a textbook? So anyway, that's not a ban. But the people that are using that word, uh, they, of course, are, are strong advocates for actual bans. For example, every college campus that I go to, they want to ban me from the campus. And very often they fail at doing it, but that's what they want to do. They want me banned from the campus, not just me, any other conservative speaker. They want us banned, not allowed. Like, and, they, and they'll use that word, actually. They're not just trying to ban books. They're trying to ban people. Banning and censorship. They want to, uh, you know, what, 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 where do you find that in our, in our culture? You find that in social media. People with opposing views, they want them banned from social media platforms, deplatformed. That's what banning and censorship looks like. Uh, speaking of leftist students being upset, this is also a good time to announce, as, we, as I announced yesterday um, on Twitter, very excited that um, I can finally make it official that on November 17th, as our What is a Woman College Tour continues, I will be going to Berkeley. Um, so we will, be, we will be screening the film, and I'll be speaking at Berkeley, and I'm looking forward to that. If, if, you know, this assumes that the university will, there's obviously already, go, there already is and, is, is and it's going to ramp up in the coming weeks, but there's going to be a strong push by uh, the students there at Berkeley to convince the university to shut us down. I hope the university stands strong. I can't claim that I'm necessarily confident they will, but if they withstand that pressure, then we will be at Berkeley on November 17th showing the film and I'll be talking and um, why are we going to Berkeley? Well, I mean, are we going there because it'll be hilarious to see the epic freak out meltdown temper tantrum? Yeah, that is part of it. I, I, I can't deny that that's part of my motivation. I do enjoy that. But it's also just on, on principle. You know, because we said we're going to Berkeley and I've heard from other conservatives, hey, you're going, hey why are you going there? Are you sure about that? Are you sure you want to go to Berkeley? Don't you know what they, what they do when, when conservatives show up there? Yeah, that's all the more reason why I want to go. Just in principle. There, there, there should not be any American university. I don't care how far left it is. I don't care if it is Berkeley. There should not be any American university that, that is insulated from not even just opposing viewpoints, but the truth. As I'm always emphasizing, the students that try to shut down our talks, they're not, they are not merely shutting down opposing viewpoints. They are doing that. But more to the point, they're shutting down the truth because what we are talking about, what I am there to talk about, are basic, fundamental, scientific truths about life. And there should not be, I, I just reject the notion that there is or ought to be any university in the country, supposedly an institution of higher learning that is insulated from the truth, where you can't, you can't go on the campus and speak basic truths. I, don't re I reject that. And so if you tell me that, well, you know, you can say these things on uh, these places, but you can't go to that university and speak those truths. When you tell me that, then I'm going to say, well, then that, that's exactly where I'm going. All right. This is from uh, The Daily Wire. It says, billionaire Elon Musk will reportedly gut Twitter with massive cuts when he takes over, getting rid of the overwhelming majority of the company. The Washington Post reported that Musk told prospective investors that he plans to get rid of nearly 75% of Twitter's 7,500 workers, whittling the company down to a skeleton staff of just over 2,000. The report said that even if, the Musk's, uh, even if Musk's acquisition of Twitter somehow does not go through, large cuts are still expected as the current people running the company plan to get rid of roughly 25% of the company's staff. So they were already planning on making big cuts of 25%. Elon Musk say, is saying, let's triple that and get rid of 75%. The report said that the plan cuts by Twitter's executives helped to explain why the company wanted to sell to Musk once he made the offer. The social media platform had been fighting Musk in court over his attempt to cancel the previous uh, buy, so we know about all that. So 75% is what, they're, what, they're, uh, what Elon Musk supposedly is planning to cut. I think this is great news. I don't generally make a habit of celebrating job loss um, unless it's at Twitter 
or if it's at like Planned Parenthood, or uh, if it's anywhere else in big tech, or if it's in the federal government. So maybe I do make a habit of celebrating job loss. But anyway, this is great news because, uh, because primarily because absolutely gutting the staff is the only real way to make the woke censorship and all of that go away. And this is one of the reasons why the media, when they're reporting on this, they're, they're panicking over it because, well, there's not going to be enough. Uh, there's going to be misinfo- quote unquote misinformation and hate speech all over Twitter. There's not going to be enough people there to put out all these fires. Yeah, that's exactly the point. You know, I've already declared my intention, which, I'm, which I uh, still intend on this, my, my intention to go on a, a misgendering spree. It's going to be a misgendering massacre once Elon Musk takes over. I'll just be, I'll just be misgendering everyone all the time, and it'll be great. But that also assumes that the old regime is actually cleared out. Um, because if it's not, if Elon Musk takes over, and, but then almost everyone else stays in place beneath him, then there's no actual reason to think that anything changes. And one thing that we know is that it's, it's very hard to change a fundamentally left-wing institution, even from the top. Donald Trump discovered that. And the fundamentally left-wing institution, in his case, was the federal government. But it's very hard to do. And the more people that there are, the, the, the bigger the bureaucracy, uh, the more difficult it is. So the only way is to go in there and just clean, clean the place out. Which, fortunately, looks like that's what he is um, planning to do. All right, this is from the Daily Mail. A hospital banned a sex assault victim from having an operation after she asked for all-female nursing care because of safety concerns over mixed facilities. Now, the patient, a feminist retired lawyer um, that uh, is, is the Daily Mail's referring to only as Emma, was told by London's Princess Grace Hospital that it had to protect staff from unacceptable distress. So she had been due to have complex colorectal surgery at the um, premises on October 10th and had filled in a pre-admission form detailing her requirements. Emma, who lives in North London, asked for single-sex accommodation and, as per her beliefs, did not wish to use pronouns or engage with such manifestations of gender ideology. She told Mail Online, I was not going to agree to fill in reams of hospital paperwork about my non-existent gender identity or give my pronouns to anyone. The hospital is one of the only, uh, one of only a handful uh, to use the Da Vinci robot, which can perform delicate and complex operations and was selected for that reason. But when she arrived on October 6th for her clinical pre-op assessment, which involved intimate procedures, what appeared to be a transgender woman, otherwise known as a man, in a blonde wig and makeup, opened the door and made eye contact with her. The encounter prompted her to complain and to make an urgent extra request for all-female nursing care. Emma told Mail Online, I began to wonder if it was just a coincidence that this member of the staff with a gender identity had uh, made their presence felt to me in such an inappropriate way during my first visit. I began to suspect that I had been targeted because my patient records showed that I refused to use use pronouns and wanted single-sex facilities, although I have no evidence of this. Then I began to panic that men would be attending to my intimate care at the hospital while I was immobilized for an entire week following major surgery. It was a slow, draining realization. Uh, I felt sick. Alarm bells were ringing in my head. I cannot describe the fear that I felt. I cannot rationalize it. She wrote to HCA that that evening, underlining her concerns and her beliefs relating to gender and women's rights. Emma cited the landmark case um, involving Maya Forstater, which said gender critical beliefs were protected under the Equality Act and worthy of respect. Okay, okay. So that just to summarize from here, so she's at she's at the hospital for this, uh, as they put it, intimate uh, procedure, and or she's going to be very you know sort of vulnerable, and she made the request ahead of time that she only wants female staff, and all this was was known ahead of time. And uh, it ends with the hospital telling her that, well, actually, we can't honor that request. Because, because, you know, if you you want to get the surgery here, then we're going to include men in it who claim that they're women. Because they said it's distressing. It's distressing to the man dressed as a woman if he's not allowed to be involved in your procedure. It's distressing to him. And so they end up canceling the procedure that she desperately needs. Okay, this is not a cosmetic procedure. This is a, this is a, a desperately needed medical procedure that they cancel because she didn't want, you know, she wanted her privacy respected. And what they what they told her was, you can have your privacy and your dignity, or you can get the necessary medical procedure, but you can't have all of those things. 
This is another one of those cases where you, you, you see this and, and uh, the, the temptation, especially on the right, is to make the point, right, that the hospital, as we, as we see so often, the hospital is putting the feelings of the trans person over the physical safety and physical well-being of a woman. You know, they're putting, safety, they're putting feelings over safety and physical well-being. And that's true. That is what they're doing. That's the same thing that happens when they allow men into women's locker room. It's same, we see that all over the place. But when we make this argument, it doesn't, it doesn't sink in on the left. And the reason it doesn't sink in is because before you can even make that argument, you first have to explain why physical safety and physical well-being are more important than feelings, because that's not how they see it. I mean, they really believe that the most important thing in life are your feelings. And that is, in fact, more important even than your own physical safety. That's like the only reason that you exist is, is for your feelings. The only reason that anyone else in the world exists is to affirm and validate your feelings and make you feel better by yourself. That's the way they see it, which is insane and twisted and upside down. But it's one of the reasons why sometimes I, I, I think that the, the, the better argument here which, which by all rights is a worse argument, but kind of arguing on their terms a little bit, using their terms against them. Okay, let's take physical safety out of it then. Even though that's obviously more important than feelings, but okay, let's put that aside. So then, okay, we have a competition of feelings then. So it's the feeling of this guy. He's going to be distressed if he's not allowed to be involved versus the feelings of the woman. She'll be distressed if he is involved. So if feelings are primary, which I'm not admitting or agreeing that they are, but according to you, they are. So we've got the male's feelings versus the female's feelings. Whose feelings come first? Well, obviously they say that the male's feelings come first, but we should force them to say that. Force them to admit that. What you are saying is that this biological male, his feelings come before the feelings of this woman, or any woman, indeed. All right, we uh, told you a few days ago about the bar in Oregon that is uh, planning to feature a child drag queen. And we also told you about this child's groomers, her, um, and it is apparently a her, her. This is a girl dressed like a drag queen, dancing for money at bars. So we told you about all that. Well, now we got an update from Andy No. He says... Um, Old Nick's Pub released a statement from friends and family of the child drag queen. It contains falsehoods about uh, the report, one of the reporters who worked on this story along with Andy No. It says that she released the name of the child. She did not. Statement says that she's in a relationship with a proud boy, and this is also false. And here's a little bit of what the statement says. It says, thanks to a woman known on Twitter as Honey Badger Mom, who also felt the need to make assumptions about the situation and released the name of an 11-year-old child to millions online, we, Vanellope's family and friends, have decided that it's time to lay the rumors to rest and, and present the facts in regard to the relationship between Vanellope and Kelsey Meta Boren. We realize that we should have made, an earlier, made one earlier in the week, but taking care of Vanellope has been our priority. Right. They're um, taking care of the child, Vanellope is the stage name. Taking care of her is their priority, which is why they're putting her up on stage at bars to dance for money in a drag outfit. V was made a victim of doxing by Miss, Mrs. Honey Badger Mom, who was married to a well-known proud boy, which caused her to be unable to attend school the entire week due to safety concerns, causing serious stress, trauma, and anxiety for the child and family. Regarding the relationship between Vanellope and a well-known and a woman known as uh, Kelsey Metaboren, there in fact was no relationship, relationship beyond a professional one. Metaboren only interacted with V a total of maybe four or five times in professional settings for venues and charity events. Meta Bourne was not a family friend, nor was she ever a mentor for V in the drag world. Um, and then it goes on from there. But that's that's the excuse that they're offering. And I, I don't doubt, by the way, that this child is traumatized and, and all that. I don't doubt that for a second. But it's you, the, quote, friends and family that have caused this trauma. And I was also thinking about just, just again, because I wasn't sure about this when we first talked about the story. It wasn't clear how, what, what the actual genders were. But now it does seem clear that, that the child is a girl. And, and that's, in a way, you're tempted to say it's almost worse. Now, it's not worse. They're equally horrific. Whether it's a boy or girl being put in this environment, um, it's equally horrific. But it's, it's horrifying in a, in a different sort of way when it's a girl. Because 
when they dress a boy up like a drag queen and they have him dance around, it's predatory, it's sick, it's wrong, it's evil, it's abusive. All the adults involved should be, should be rounded up, put in handcuffs, frog marched to prison and kept there for decades. All that is the case. But they have this excuse, you know, where they say, well, no, this is about uh, diversity and expression and uh, breaking gender barriers and whatever. Those are horrible excuses, not remotely convincing or acceptable. But I guess my question is, what even is the excuse for having a girl do this? How do you, how do you, your explanation for having a boy do it is insane. But what is your explanation for having a girl do it? This is just, it's just, it's, it's simply straight up burlesque. It's, it's just like, it's a, it's a really kind of straightforward burlesque performance by like a 10-year-old girl at a bar with people throwing money at her. Um, and this is what, this is what is happening. Somehow cloaked, uh, you know, it's, it, it's under this umbrella of LGBT expression. It's like, it's got nothing even to do with that. And if it did, that still obviously wouldn't make it okay, but it's, it's like not, it's, it just defies, it defies explanation. And there is no real explanation they can give for any of this because, uh, because if they were to be honest about it, um, you know, what they're doing is they're sexualizing kids and they're doing it on purpose. And that's, of course, what the intention is. All right, let's get now to the comment section. You know, uh, chain stores, they have different price tiers for professional mechanics and do-it-yourselfers. But the good thing about rockauto.com is the prices are the same for everybody, and they're reliably low for everybody. rockauto.com always offers the lowest prices possible rather than changing prices uh, based on what they think the market will bear like airlines do. rockauto.com is a family-owned business serving auto parts customers online for 20 years. Go to rockauto.com for sh- for uh Auto and body parts from hundreds of manufacturers. They have everything you need from engine control modules, brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, even new carpet. It's all there. Whether this is for your classic or your daily driver, you can get everything you need with just a few easy clicks delivered straight to your door. The rockauto.com catalog is very easy to navigate. Best of all, most important thing to me is that the prices at rockauto.com are always reliably low, again, for everybody. Amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need at rockauto.com. So go to rockauto.com right now, see all the parts available for your car or truck, uh, rockauto.com, and be sure to write Walsh in their How Did You Hear About Us box so they know that I sent you. Noah Hecker says, hearing Matt read the description of a weeb warms my cold heart. Well, there's not a lot of heartwarming moments on the show, I don't think, so I'm glad that I could provide that for you. Zimmer Handcrafted says, Matt didn't even mention the suggestion to put birth control in the water from the Jaff memo. Uh, Yeah, I mean, there's a whole lot more in the Jaff memo that we talked about yesterday to start the show. And just go online and and Google Jaff memo and you'll see, uh, you can get a PDF of it, look at it yourself. Uh, Yeah, there's a a, a lot in there. And, um, you know, there are it's, I guess you decide what's more kind of terrifying. It's the, the stuff that was suggested that didn't happen, like compulsory abortions for out of wedlock pregnancy. That has not happened yet. So is that what's more terrifying or, or all the stuff in there that they really did? Um, no, it's a judgment call either way. Professor Chimp says, Matt, I just got to say you're completely correct that the countless planets in the known universe have a purpose for being there and undoubtedly harbor life. Knowles needs to be canceled if he hasn't been already. Well, of course he has been. And uh, there was just another, I'm glad you brought that up because I had to, I couldn't get to it in the five headlines, but there was just another story in um, the Daily Wire reports. Well, maybe I'll mention it now. It says various veteran pilots flying over the Pacific Ocean in August and September have claimed that they saw UFOs flying in circles above them in the night sky. Okay, so once again, You've got these pilots are saying, we're seeing UFOs, and you can see some of the footage. And it's just, these it's obviously crafts. These are some kind of vehicles that are behaving in ways that seem to defy what human technology can do. And I, I, I just don't buy, I know the, the explanation that most people go with is that, well, this is enemy technology, drones or whatever. I don't buy it. Because for one thing, if, if, uh, if we had an, an adversary here on Earth that had that kind of technology, 
Um, I think they'd be doing more by now than just like flying around in the sky and putting on a show for us. So it is 100% confirmed to be aliens, without a question. Um, let's see. Tyrannic Cubone says, I'm impressed. It seems that Matt has refined his argument against pornography to include the very reason that I, ha- that I have uh, given up for, uh, to include the very reason I have given for using it and has come up with a far better metaphor than I have. I never said I thought pornography is better than relationship, but if you have to choose between dying of starvation and dying of malnutrition, you'll choose the option that will buy you more time. At least that's the calculation at first, but like he said, you're also more inclined to give up pursuing a real relationship once you're no longer starving for one. Right, and that's exactly the point, is that it, it becomes, um, it ends up becoming a substitute for a real human relationship, and it numbs, you know, without pornography, and without all this, without the, the hypersexualization in the culture, um, you, you know, even without all that, of course, as, as men and women too, but speaking about men, you know, you have this, desires, natural desire for, as we said yesterday, for, for, for female companionship. And historically, right, that's what drives you to find a woman, you get into a relationship, you marry her, you start a family, you know, and that's the, that's the engine that gets you going in that direction. But with pornography and all the sex everywhere, it, it, it numbs a man's, um, you know, instincts and, and his desires in that, in that direction. All right. Kristen Pierce says, this whole conversation about reclining the seat on an airplane is being talked about as if seats on an airplane recline more than an inch. Stephen Mackey says, you buy the seat, the seat reclines, you can recline the seat, end of story. Timothy says, maybe Matt has forgotten what it's like to be a normal person who can't afford to fly in first class. If the seat that I paid for in coach is a reclining seat, then I have the right to recline it. Rudy says, if the seat allows you to recline it, then you can recline it. Okay, all of you, I understand, yes, you can, you have the right to. If I was in charge, you wouldn't even have the legal right, but uh, under the current regime, you do. So you have the legal right to, you have the ability to. Yeah, you can physically recline the seat. That doesn't mean you get okay. Okay, I can, I, can, I can physically make movements with my, I can move my arms around. I can physically make a punching movement with my arm. Does that make it acceptable then to go just walk up and punch you in the face? Just, and if I punch you in the face, can I say, well, what do you mean? My arm moves like that. If my arm can do that, then I should be able to do it. And yes, it's exactly the same thing morally. Reclining your seat is like punching the person. You know, it's not even punch, like spitting in their face, showing total disregard for them. I guess I just have more, maybe in the end, I have more empathy and compassion. Although I am, you know, it's like when you can sit in first class, then it's, this isn't as much of an issue. So I do highly recommend that. Uh, History at Headline says, what is the most important issue we're currently facing? Well, I think we just, I think we just stumbled on it. It's uh, should we recline our seats on the airplane? And it's all the more urgent now. Uh, now that I see that you know so, so many people, there's, there's so much there's so much pro reclining propaganda out there that we have to battle. Quick look at the weather. Liberal tears have been falling all over the country in Illinois and Florida at my What Is a Woman campus tour, Washington D.C. at the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And with Election Day on the horizon, we can expect 2022 to be one of the wettest years on record. That's why, for the first time, we're making the iconic Daily Wire Leftist Tears Tumblr available to everybody so we can catch all these leftist tears. Don't go any, let any of them go to waste. Forge in the fires of the hottest takes. This magnificent vessel is now just $30. Don't miss out on the heavy tear fall. Go to uh, dailywire.com slash tumblr and get your Leftist Tears Tumblr right now. Now let's get to our daily cancellation. Earlier in the month, a man named Adam Lane Smith tweeted his thoughts about depression. Uh, Smith identifies himself as a retired psychotherapist turned attachment specialist. Not really sure what an attachment specialist is exactly, but I know that um, this one had an interesting thought to share about depression. He wrote, quote, male depression is nearly always a result of learned helplessness, but healthcare providers treat it like female depression and they try to make a man feel loved instead of powerful. That's what he said. Now, this take, as you might expect, provoked a fair amount of outrage and mockery. So just a quick sampling of some of the replies. Someone said, LMFAO, this is the dumbest thing I've read all day. Why are we gendering depression? Like, I, a female, do not have depression because I don't feel loved. I have depression because my brain doesn't make enough serotonin. 
Quick note here, no, that's not why you feel depressed. The, the serotonin theory of depression has been exposed as a myth propagated by the pharmaceutical industry, just so you know. Anyway, a few more responses. Someone says, LMAO, because there's no way women feel depressed thanks to this misogynistic society that makes us powerless? Of course. Someone else posts, misogynistic post. Love is universal. Sure, maybe masculine and feminine energies could be more balanced, but like, what the F does gender have to do with strength or feeling loved? We're all the same. Now, these kinds of rebuttals were offered in even greater volume and with greater fury after a Twitter account called Bad Medical Takes posted a screenshot inviting, you know, further mockery. The funny thing about the Bad Medical Takes account is that most of the bad medical takes that they post are actually pretty good medical takes. And that's the case here. So I want to talk more about the reaction to this guy's observation. Um, there are a few important points to be, make, to be made there, I think. But I, I want to start, I guess, by engaging with the actual point, which is what we should do. So is it true that literally all cases of male depression can be explained with the simple one-sentence summary that he offers? Is it true that men don't need to feel loved at all and women don't need to feel powerful at all? Is, is this statement a universal, 100% applicable diagnosis of every case of depression in the entire world? No. But I also don't think it was intended that way. It seems to me that he's making a general observation meant to challenge current assumptions uh, that people make and to encourage us to think differently about a subject that mainstream wisdom often gets wildly wrong. And to that end, there's quite a lot of value and insight here. First, he's acknowledging something that is usually ignored in this conversation and in every other conversation, which is that men and women are different. And so they're going to experience depression differently, broadly speaking, because they are different. Okay, we're all human beings. We're all aware of our own existence and of our place within a broken world full of pain and suffering, which means that there's going to be a lot of similarities in our experiences of depression because that's where it all ultimately comes from. But it's not going to be exactly the same because we have different emotional needs. And the differences are, they're a matter of degree, of kind of calibration. So it's not that men have emotional needs that don't exist at all for women or vice versa but rather that our priorities tend to be different, and we also tend to interpret our experiences differently. So an example that's very relevant to the topic at hand. If a woman is unhappy in her marriage, it's likely because at bottom she doesn't feel loved and appreciated. If a man is unhappy, it's likely because at bottom he doesn't feel respected. Now, it's not that she doesn't need respect or he doesn't need love. It would maybe be more accurate to say that... Uh, you know, maybe you could say that the, the best way to love a man is to respect him, and the best way to respect a woman is to love her. Now, you might say that this is kind of hair-splitting because love and respect in this context are not two distinct and separable things. They are dimensions of each other. Um, you can't really love someone if you don't respect them or respect them if you don't love them, at least not in the context of a marriage, and all that's true. Yet it's also true that men are more likely to interpret their unhappy marriage in terms of its lack of respect, while women are more likely to interpret it in terms of a lack of love. And they're both right in different ways. As to depression, uh, my primary issue with Smith's take is that he, I think he gives too much credit to the medical industry, actually. He says that they assume that all depressed people, men and women, just need to feel loved. I wish that was the mistake they made. I think more often the assumption is that everyone, men and women alike, simply need not love, but just the right prescription. Love has nothing to do with it. But, but he's largely right, I think, from a cultural perspective. And all you have to do is listen to the things people say, to the mantras, mantras and bumper sticker slogans and all that that are supposed to make depressed people feel better. You know, things like, uh, it's okay to not be okay. You are loved. You are special. All that sort of thing. It's a very feminine-oriented message. Though I suspect that these slogans don't do much for women either. That first one, especially, it's okay to not be okay projects powerlessness. It encourages almost. And this is a problem because, indeed, a great many men in our culture feel powerless. They feel as though they have no control over their own lives. This is one of the, the main reasons that so many men have dropped out of the dating pool, like we talked about yesterday. They fear that marriage is a losing game. I hear this all the time. They think that marriage is rigged against men and that they'll become even more powerless and vulnerable than they already are if they get married. Look also at, at, uh, at you know, in, in extreme cases, look at men who lash out violently, whether we're talking about drug dealers on the street corner or school shooters or whatever. The violent outburst is, among other things, a twisted, tragic way of exercising power and control. 
Men who commit suicide are also, in their minds, taking control, exercising power over their own fate for what may feel to them to be the first and last time in their lives. I said yesterday that men in this culture uh, suffer from a lack of purpose and direction. But powerlessness is a, is a key factor here as well. Because in order for a man to find his purpose, in order for him to decide on a direction and walk down it, he first has to feel that he has the power to do so, that he has control, that he has agency over his own life. You know, that stereotypical image of the depressed jobless guy down in the basement playing video games all day, this is an image of helplessness, of a man who feels he has no power over his life. And, and this is where the actual message that he gets from the healthcare providers only makes things worse. By treating depression and despair as purely medical issues, as a physical disease that can be cured with a drug, we are encouraging the, the depressed person, whether male or female, to feel powerless. Like all they can do is take a pill and just hope that it saves them. And anyone who encourages lifestyle changes, you know, more exercise, better diet, anyone who suggests that if you're feeling down, maybe, you know, you go outside and, and get some fresh air and some sunshine. Do something with your free time other than staring at glowing screens all day. Anyone who gives the depressed person things that they can actively do to help their situation is shouted down. And that's because this powerlessness is intentionally fostered. The medical industry has found it quite profitable to have a country full of powerless people who think that their only hope for the future lies in a pill. So there is indeed a lot of truth in what uh, Smith has to say, despite how it was received. In fact, it was received negatively because there was so much truth in it. And that brings me to my final point. Agree or disagree with his opinion. It is at least an interesting thought, okay? A great many thoughts are shared on the internet every day. Millions and millions of thoughts. And most of them are not remotely interesting. And I don't care right now if they're right or wrong. They're not interesting. It's not that the thoughts are all wrong. Many of them are, but that's not the point. The point is that everyone is talking. The chatter never stops. And, and yet most of what's being said is boring, redundant, just simply uninteresting. Lots of talk, very little insight. That's at least in part because this is what happens to anyone who dares to say something interesting. Like you go out on a limb and you kind of, even if you're sort of like experimenting with an idea, maybe you're thinking out loud a little bit, you're trying to work through something and uh, you know, maybe you haven't even, and I'm not saying this is the case with, with here, but but I mean, God forbid, you're just kind of like, uh, you're thinking about this and you're, and you're talking through it and the idea isn't fully formed, but you think you've kind of, you're, you're, you're walking down the right direction and so you, you just go out on a limb and you, and you offer your thought. And if you do that, you're descended upon, you're ripped apart, you're mocked. Anyone who ventures even a few inches outside the box is belittled by all of the dull, mindless drones inside the box. It's the nature of the internet to encourage these kinds of reactions because you would never react that way in real life, right? If you were sitting around in a living room having a conversation and a few drinks and Adam Lane Smith was there and, uh, you know, you got to talking about uh, depression and all this and he made the point that male depression often stems from powerlessness, you wouldn't start shouting at him or laughing in his face or mocking him with snide comments. Unless you are the most insufferable dork on the planet, you wouldn't respond, pfft. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, moron. Instead, you would say something like, hmm, yeah, that's interesting. Here's what I think. And the conversation would continue. But on the internet, the goal is to score points, right? It's, it's not to have a conversation. Certainly not to reach an understanding. The goal, if anything, is the opposite of understanding. It's to ensure that what the other person said is not understood. And come to think of it, this is all probably contributing to the problem of helplessness because it can be rather a helpless feeling to share a thoughtful insight and have it mindlessly ripped apart by stupid, pedantic, disingenuous trolls. All the more validation for the point that Smith raised. All the more reason to say to his critics, not to him, you are today canceled. And that'll do it for this portion of the show as we move over to the members block. Um, hope to see you there. If not, hope to at least see you out at the uh, rally today. And if not then, then on Monday. Godspeed.